It's just in North I Carolina. I think I'm being told we're ready to begin, ready to commence. Am I correct? I'm looking to the back of the room for nodding. Yes, wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, you're enjoying the 18th annual Milken Institute Conference. I know I am. It's my first. I feel very much like a newbie. I'm really excited to be moderating what I think is one of the most innovative topics at the Milken Institute this year, which is the topic on gender inclusivity in investment strategy and in business growth and performance. And for those of you who didn't notice this morning, Mr. Milken himself wrote a uh, fantastic piece in the Wall Street, no, wrong, in, it was Wall Street Journal, right? Wall Street Journal, a great op-ed piece on the role of men. So Chris, thank you for being our man today and joining us. Uh, Be here. <laughs> because there is a role for men, and for those of you who are in the room of that gendered persuasion, please welcome and join the conversation with us. You have the panelists' bios, and uh, so we're going to dive right into the meatiness of our topic. Our topic today really is about a call to action. The exciting news is the opportunity. So let me just frame for all of you a bit of the opportunity, and then we'll open up to our panelists. And then, of course, we'll open to the audience at Q&A the last 15 minutes. For the last 30 years, women have been over half of the educated, college-educated population here in the US. Today, we are more than 60% of the PhDs. We are fantastically represented within the medical professions within MBA programs, law degrees, and yet our numbers, specifically within private equity, remain powerfully low. Within venture capital, less than 5% of venture capital today is going to women-led companies. Within the venture capital groups themselves, fewer than 5% of the general partners are women. So you can see a phenomenal and powerful disconnect between opportunity and a realization of that opportunity. Today's panelists are, are here to provide thought leadership on the subject of this substantial disconnect in the market. I've asked them to think about the state of things and a positive call to action for all of us. Where do we expect to see the shifts in the market? Where are the thought leaders? And what are those thoughts that they can put forward for our strategies? And where can we invest now? Because as I look at the landscape of investment opportunities as an early stage investor, I see over 1,200 deals a year that are ready for venture and angel investment at the early stages. And yet that 5% number lingers and has lingered for 20 years. So lots of opportunity and lots for us to discuss as a panel. We have a great mix of investor and entrepreneur perspectives. And Chris, since you are the represent gentleman on the panel, mm -hmm. I'd love to begin with your thoughts, specifically on the male call to action as it relates to private equity broadly, and obviously as a, a substantial LP, your perspective as an LP as well. No, thanks. Uh, uh, at CalSTRS, uh, we're just under $200 billion in assets, uh, and gender diversity has been an enormous issue to us for a long, long time. 72% uh, of our population is female, as we represent teachers throughout the state of California. And in private equity, we have continued to see it be a real struggle. Uh, when private equity firms come to visit us, they'll have one representative woman in the meeting. Um, and we have poked them and prodded them to try and increase that amount, and I think it is far too slow. So my I'm, I'm proud of Milken for getting up to 30% of the speakers and the attendance. Uh, when I walked in, it's unfortunately probably about my 13th or 14th Milken, but I walked in this morning and I realized that it was getting much more diverse and it was nice to see the change uh, away from, as I always say, pale, male, and stale uh, to a much more diverse crowd. So, um, and if you could bring up uh, slide six for me. Um, I think this gets off private equity a bit, but for us, a major issue is uh, in the corporations. We have uh, over $100 billion of equity investments in the portfolio, and we have seen this time and again uh, where women are underrepresented on corporate boards. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, what really amazes us is that in the United States, you'll have one woman on a board, but it takes two to make a motion. Somebody has to second that motion. 
And so we have really been pushing our companies to expand their diversity. And if you could bring up uh, slide seven, I think this is the telling information. Um, we have seen this time and again, Catalyst has done a wonderful job in New York of showing that when companies have three or more women on the board, they outperform. So it just simply, it's not just common sense, it makes money. And we've been trying to explain that also to private equity firms, that you get away from that groupthink, that narrowness of thought, you bring in different perspectives. And I guess the, the call to action I would have, uh, the role for men, in my view, very strongly, is to be open and to expand uh, the opportunities uh, and to bring in more women into their investment portfolios um, and also to, to give them a greater opportunity for advancement. The challenge I would give all the women is really, and I think I said it last year on a panel similar to this, is as you climb up, up that ladder, turn around and put your hand back and pull somebody else up. I know too frequently the fear is, but she's younger, she's more active, uh, she's competition because there are so few slots for women. But if we can get women to network together, uh, Sally Krawcheck has done a wonderful job of be building a regional, it's a national program, but to build regional um, centers for women to work together, lawyers, doctors, investment professionals to work together and network. And I think that's really the key is building that powerful network and supporting each other and climbing up. So my call to men is to increase diversity, but my call to women is to reach out and help each other. Uh, we have a diverse director database uh, of thousands of names on it now. Uh, and what we're doing is going to corporations and really pushing them to try and, and reach out to bring in more women. And I think, as John Paulson said, I'm not a fan of quotas. I hear that over and over again. But darn it, the 30% club in, in Europe is working, or in the UK is working. And maybe, as he said, maybe it's time for that in the United States. We certainly should at least have, if you're familiar in the National Football League, they have something called the Rooney Rule, where one of the owners said, you know what? If you're going to interview people to be head coach, one of them has to be a diverse candidate. I think we have to turn that around on corporations and say to corporations, you know what? If you have an open board seat, one of the people you interview at least has to be a woman. The corporations tell us, well, we want former CEOs. Well, there aren't enough women CEOs. So you're going to have to accept, accept somebody who's a vice president or somebody who's the CFO or, or COO. That's the only way we're going to break through this. But I, I actually am of the view that we're getting closer to where in America we need some kind of a, a quota or at least a whole new standard to really actually make a difference rather than just tread water year in and year out. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate uh, your thoughts, and I appreciate you highlighting that in private equity, you, you saw one GP generally. And Seema, that's a great segue to you and in, in some of the thought leadership you've provided to the market and the programs you're now preparing for the market. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so uh, I was the CIO of the city of New York and the pension funds up until last June. And since then, I have worked on a project that I'm excited to tell you about. But, but similar to what Chris was saying, I sat in that seat for a while. And before that, I'd been in the private sector managing portfolios at big hedge funds and big mutual fund companies and for nearly 20 years. And there aren't a lot of women in asset management. And when I sat in the seat as CIO, I didn't meet any senior women in private equity in invest, you know, on the investing side. Yes, there are general counsels, and that's fabulous, and there are COOs, and that's fabulous. And uh, you know, there's people in uh, marketing and business development. That's wonderful. But I had not met one senior investment professional. I was a woman in private equity uh, until I left the city and started talking to a number of folks about this new project that I'm working on called Girls Who Invest. Um, so what I had done really in the last year that I was with the city, I spoke very publicly about this issue of where are all the women on your investment team? By the way, big hedge fund founder, man, big private equity founder, man, real estate founder, man. And there's no problem with that. It's just, what's going on? Uh, and I'd look at their org charts, and I'd say, I don't get it. I mean, I'm a woman in the business. I've got friends in the business. We're out there. I don't know why you're not finding them. And the answer I would get back is, Seema, we don't get the resumes. And after the hundredth time of hearing that, I thought, OK. Maybe there is a pipeline problem. OK, I'm willing to agree with you on that. 
So if you do have a problem, call me and I'll help you find those women. Well, the more I started saying that, the more people started saying, all right, go do it. So I find myself now in a position where uh, I've just been so fortunate over the last several months to have met the most incredible people in our business. I got hundreds of emails from folks in our business, men and women, because we, we have to have the men to help us, uh, college professors, business school professors, high school principals. Um, I wrote an op-ed that got published by Bloomberg last September, and it was all about this issue of where are all the women in asset management, and how do we help fix it? And so as a result of all that encouragement, um, and all these folks shared that passion with me, I just decided I guess I do need to start something called Girls Who Invest. Um, so it's real. It is formed. Uh, we're incorporated. I have a board, which is spectacular. Um, I've, uh, you know, we've got a website, so there is one page that says check back soon. Uh, <laughs> but there is something now that exists called girlswhoinvest.org, and the whole idea behind it is to go to, start young, go to high schools, go to colleges, and then go to business schools. And so we as Girls Who Invest are going to create programming around this, create excitement around this for these young women, so that we can hopefully create this massive pipeline, this massive volume of women who are interested in going into this business, stay in the business, um, create communities around this so women do want to stay in the business, um, and ultimately reach those levels such that we can start changing these cultures. Because that's a really hard thing is, is these environments. And I know lots of studies have been done and lots of research has been done that diversity makes sense. You saw the slides up there about corporate board representation. Um, you got to believe that it would happen the same way in an investment portfolio when you manage an investment portfolio. So with all that said, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, inside of these cultures. Um, and I'll just throw out one example where uh, you know, we're a big allocator. We invested in a hedge fund. There was one manager. We went to go visit them. And you know, it was new to our relationship. So they, we sat down. And of course, you go through the portfolio, and you talk about the positions. But then they talk about the organization. You always get an update. And so I'm taking notes. And uh, they said, oh, and we just hired three analysts on our investment team. It's like, oh, great. Who are they? John, Jim, and Joe. And I thought, <laughs> are you kidding me? So I looked at the founder, and I said, OK, wait a minute. You couldn't find a woman? Oh, no, Seema, we didn't get any resumes. And I said, oh my god. Did you even try? Did you even interview any? Um, and he said, you know, we really have tried so hard. And I said, you know what? Have you even thought for one second, just even thought about it, that maybe there's something about you and your firm and your culture, which is why women don't want to come work here? <laughs> and he said, oh my god, you really think that could be true? And I said, oh, <laughs> you haven't even thought about it. So. There's a lot of work to be done, but um, I'm really excited about this initiative. I need everybody's help to do it. Uh, and so look out. I'm going to recruit all of you to help us. But, uh, but I think it's critical, and, and so I'm glad we're getting this going. Melody, you've been a thought leader, well published on the topic of the importance of diversity in business and the role of really leaders like yourself in the industry in, in helping set the stage and the table for that conversation. What are some of your thoughts that we should, we should all reflect upon? And really, where do you see forward movement? Where are those real nuggets of opportunity happening that we should all know about and, and map towards? Well, I think. One of the things about my answer, which will be slightly different um, in the context of this discussion, is I'm thinking of diversity in the broadest sense. And so my controversial statement <laughs> that I once made to my very dear friend, Cheryl Sandberg, is that the number one beneficiary of diversity in America have been white women. And she and I, like, Literally, she's like, not true, not true. I'm like, true, true, <laughs> true. And we are, I mean, we love each other. So I say that with true, um, you know, emotion. But this is something that I think is, is important for us to put on the table, which is that I'm thinking about women's issues, of course. But I'm also thinking about issues related to people of color. And if you're a woman who is of color, we're considered double jeopardy. And so you end up having a very, very unique view of the world. And so my efforts have been to not create a story that is a zero sum game, but to create an opportunity for everyone to win. Because I think, as we like to say around Ariel, if everyone is in the room, you get a better outcome. You actually don't have to choose. Yeah. So 
um, one of the things that we've been doing in this regard is that we have launched an effort where more than a dozen years in the effort, we created a conference called the Black Corporate Directors Conference. Now there are many black women and there are black men as well, but there are less black women because um, there just aren't as many black women on corporate boards, especially for Fortune 500 boards. But our effort has been really to speak to this issue of holding corporations accountable and holding the individuals who are in the room, to Chris's point, accountable to push these agendas. So as a board member in a room, you are a fiduciary to the shareholders. We're never going to counter or argue that that isn't the case. But as a fiduciary, you're thinking of this business in its totality. And our point of view is that the business is more successful to the extent there is a more diverse group of people running it. They will reach a more diverse customer and ultimately be more successful. So it is in the best interest <coughs> of the organization for that diversity to be there. So at the Black Corporate Directors Conference, we focus on the three Ps. And this is where we truly have seen movement. We now, we started off with less than 30 directors. We now have several hundred. Fantastic. And interestingly, still not a lot of women. Um, but progress nonetheless. And the three Ps that we focus are on people, making sure the organization has a diverse group of people, especially at the senior level, stating the obvious to people in this room. Philanthropy, making sure the philanthropy of the corporation is inclusive as well. It should not just be the opera house or <laughs> the um, you know, pet charity of the CEO. Does it represent a community, women, minorities, et cetera? And then last but not least, we say um, purchasing. So does the company in how they do business include all the potential people who could serve that company? And so we say if you could hit the three Ps, you actually see true movement. And I tell CEOs all the time, I say, you know, when you get on a race issue where it's awkward or a gender issue that is awkward, if you have a whole bunch of women or minority vendors, they're going to jump to your defense and say, no, this is a wonderful company. And they've done wonderful things for me, my business, my employees, my community. I said, you won't, even, you won't stand alone. Mm -hmm. So this is just being practical if, you know, for all the things that do come up along the way. So we have seen real movement there. And the, the directors come back every single year to our conference, which we host in Laguna Beach, invitation only. And they actually tell us about what progress they're making in the boardroom and how they're moving the needle around these issues, which speaks to my last point. Well, I am 100% of the belief that I want everyone in the room, I certainly want the right people. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? I say this respectfully. On this issue, if Clarence Thomas was in the boardroom, it probably wouldn't move the needle because he doesn't share this point of view. I say that respectfully. I agree with you. Agreeing to disagree. He has a different opinion than I would have around affirmative action, diversity, and inclusion. So I don't want him picked <laughs> to be the person that they can check off the list and say, not picking on him, right. of course, but to be the person that is checked off the list because that doesn't really further the endeavor. So same for the woman. If the woman is going to be in the room, it can't be someone who's afraid to bring up the issue. It can't be someone who's just happy to be there. It can't be someone who's, who's excited about the fee. It's got to be someone who's willing to walk away or really throw down the gauntlet on the <laughs> issue so that we can show real progress. Because the worst thing, and I'll stop, is when the organization has the minority or the woman on the board, they can check it off, it gives them the cover, and nothing happens. Yeah. That's the worst of all scenarios. I think you're calling out a very important call to action, which is at the very individual level, right? There's a point where you, like it or not, do represent being a woman sitting at that board and either represent it or, or diverse, diversity of whatever diversity you bring, be it sexual, gender, race. And having the courage to represent it, I think, is an important component of being there. And a lot of people on this issue, I'll be the first to say, it can be, you can be standing out all on your own you are concerned about being typecast as a one issue board member. And I always tell people, listen, I'm going to be on that issue. I'm, going to, I'm a financial expert. I'm someone who's very strong with media and media relations. I'm bringing my whole self into the room. And I'm not going to pull back on one of these aspects of myself because I am concerned about how you are going to perceive me. I'm going to bring my whole self in the room because I think that's in the best interest of the company. And if for whatever reason you want to typecast me as the black director, 
fine. I'm comfortable with that because I'm not apologizing for being bad. Beautiful thoughts. I love the call to actions on a panel like this because I get to um, equally participate and learn. And, and I'm always grateful for the big thinking that happens. Shauna, you join us as an entrepreneur. And what's really, well, you've also been an investor. So you can speak about that as well, please. <laughs> but as an entrepreneur, people may not realize that kind of all of the realities of one GP being a woman or no GPs being a woman uh, actually does trickle down directly to entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial experience. And um, you know, entrepreneurs matter. All net new jobs in the last five, excuse me, 30 years have been created by companies less than five years old, right, Lisa Mitchell? We learned that from the Kaufman Foundation. So <coughs> entrepreneurs matter deeply. And we've learned from Dow Jones, taking a look at venture-backed companies, that companies that had women on the founding team actually outperformed their male-only counterparts. So here you sit as a woman entrepreneur. And I, I think we'd value hearing your uh, reflections on what will move the needle, what are our opportunities, and where should we be investing and in doubling down now? Yeah, it's interesting because this is my second round being an entrepreneur. So first time around, I think I was very unaware, um, mostly just because your head's down figuring out how do I even run a business, right? Like there's so many everyday things going on. The idea that I'm a female or I'm a you know, startup founder or I'm kind of in the tech sector or whatever, you're like, actually, I just need to come in and figure out what to do today. <laughs> this is a business I'm building. Um, so I was very unaware and I didn't want to be sort of typecast in any setting as like, like a, a woman. I didn't want to be invited to conferences just because I was going to be the token female on the panel, et cetera. Um, and I was fearful of, uh, of speaking about that too much because I felt like then that's just going to be what's attached to my name is this idea that I speak about female related issues rather than I'm a good I'm good at building companies. Um, so then I took a leap. So my last company was acquired. Then I moved to Google Ventures for a period and recently left. Um, I was there for about two years left to start my next company. And I'm in a totally different place at this point. I think one sitting on the investment side of the table gave me kind of a, a much wider lens into how much deal flow is coming in, female versus male. Um, just you know the number of founders I was interacting with, it was definitely skewed male. And I started realizing, you know, this is my place to be out there as one of the people speaking about this topic and engaged in this topic. So I'd say second time around, you know, I'm much more comfortable kind of thinking about this and thinking about it the whole time um, through this last kind of four year period. Uh, I think the, the, like, the interesting thing that Chris said at the beginning is, um, is this idea of kind of bringing people up and also just building the scaffolding is a lot of what I'm thinking about. I think what I've seen now being on the corporate side, on the investment side, and on the entrepreneurial side is that the whole ecosystem has to work together. And if you're not having that network effect working together, you're not going to see sort of the full circle of, an, of a startup going from kind of its infancy, getting funded, and then eventually getting acquired, and then eventually you know, those potential founders going back and investing into the ecosystem. And so you need supporters at every level, male and female, but you especially need those females who have gone through it continuing to work to bring new females entering into the ecosystem into the fold. Um, and I feel like that network is too small right now. I think that's the feeling that I have, um, having sat in all of these seats now, is that we aren't socializing in the same way as our male counterparts, or at least not in the same volume, um, where there are startup entrepreneurs interacting with startup uh, investors, interacting with those that go and acquire those businesses. Um, you know, much more heavily male at all of the events, both social events and then conferences, where those kinds of relationships get built. And so that's been something that's been on my mind, and I'm continuing to be active at uh, Google Ventures, I did a lot of work very informally to get female founders together, even those that were just founding companies. They weren't successful yet, but I felt like them getting to know one another this early in their career and building friendships and relationships was going to be critical to when one of them had a success, pulling the others in the door eventually, acquiring their businesses or funding their businesses down the road. And I think that that stuff needs to be happening at a wider volume, at a greater scale, um, in small groups and in bigger groups. One of the reasons I think that uh, panels like this are so intriguing to me is that it's important to highlight that no one does this well, right? So we highlighted venture is 5% funding going to women-led companies. We could just as e easily have picked on corporate America and said that the boardrooms uh, suffer. We could pick on uh, the wrong. executive level and, and say there are no, not enough women executives. So nobody does this well. This is dirty, messy, tough stuff 
really, really tough stuff. And something that I like to say is it's really important that we start to get comfortable with the uncomfortable business that needs to happen. So I wanted the panelists to reflect upon what are some of the barriers to women becoming GPs, and how do we talk about them in a way to move to solution? And what are some of the barriers to women getting venture funding that we can talk about and move uh, forward funding into women-led companies. I think I'm going to set us into one direction, but I welcome your thoughts about this. My own reflections on it are that still in the US and globally, men and women are in separate business networks. And this is a problem for our types of investment because these are relationship-intensive investments that happen. Uh, in private equity, this is a shape, look you in the eyes. This is a get to know you as an individual and actually do a gut check of, do I trust you? And that question, do I trust you, breaks down along gender, along race, along sexual orientation. And so we, as an industry, need to, at some point, start getting comfortable with the uncomfortable nature of our own business and how we've chosen comfort by doing business with people much like ourselves. If we're men and we control the venture industry, we do it with lots of other men. I'm curious what the panel thinks about the uncomfortable nature of men and women doing business together and what are some vehicles that could address that or what are the other issues at play that don't allow capital to flow as efficiently uh, as it should. <clears throat> I'll start. I mean, what, one, of the, one of the things that I felt in the industry being a woman and an investor is finding these great enlightened men <laughs> Uh, to work with, and those that I work for who become sponsors, right? So sponsors versus mentors, sponsors who accelerate your careers. Um, and it's, there is a difference. Um, and when you're fortunate enough to find them, and I've had a few in my career, you just can't let those go. Don't let those go because those are, those are deep friendships and long-term relationships, and that's how they grow, and that's what they turn into. Um, and, you know, to find that between a man and a woman inside you know, a big investment firm, particularly at a big hedge fund where I'd been before and even at a big pension fund where I was before, um, it's difficult to find. And I think um, to your point about deals and, and in venture capital and those networks, um, and Sheryl Sandberg mentioned this in her book, Lean In. This is one of the parts I really liked about it, which was this idea that when men and women are together working till three in the morning working on a deal, that's just what you do. And yet it's, it can be uncomfortable because people might be looking and saying, oh my God, can you see that those guys are working together? Like, I wonder what's going on. You know, what's wrong with us? So um, <laughs> I do think it needs to start at the top and, and that does start with men in, in most cases in our business. And I think it is uh, on them, really. It's a part of their responsibility, I think, to make it OK for men to mentor and sponsor women who report to them or don't report to them, but are certainly you know, more junior than they are. And I think it has to be made very clear throughout the culture of the firm that that is something that they believe in and that they promote. And in fact, you know, one of the ways to get them to do it, honestly, is to put it in their compensation. Right? A lot of us, if you put it in their conversation, that's how behavior gets made. Um, and I think, and I've done this actually with people that um, I've hired, is to say, hey, look, I'm going to measure you on what performance you generate, what returns you generate, how much money you make for us and for our clients. But I'm also going to care a lot about uh, you know, how you interact with the people that report to you and how you, you know, help train them and mentor them and sponsor them. Um, that's really important to me and to this firm. And so I'm going to measure you on that. Suddenly, you know, they care because, oh my god, I, I want to make a bigger bonus. Um, so I think, you know, there are things that we can do as an industry to help this. And, and these are things that, yes, will take a long time over time to play out to make it really effective. But there are some things we can do along the way. And I do think it's a matter of culturally making these kinds of things OK. Melanie. Again, I'm going to take a slightly different point of view. I always think about the fact that we have this opportunity because there aren't a lot of numbers of us to embrace the difference. So instead of it being that we do business in different ways, to use all of our differences to allow us to stand out and be different. So what do I mean by that? When I first started working at Ariel, I go to conferences. And when Ariel was started 32 years ago, we were the first minority-owned investment firm ever started. 
I've only worked at one company since I graduated from college in 1991. So <laughs> I've had one job. And many times I would go to conferences, and there would be certainly no women of color and very few women. And I started to realize very quickly that I'd go to a conference, and people would like know my name. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were like, oh, you know, you're, and I was like, they know my name because I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. That's an advantage. And I was like, I could just go as Melody and it'd be like Cher or Beyonce. <laughs> and people would not even know. They don't even need a last name because I started to realize very quickly that like I stood out in the crowd. So I'm like, OK, check. Going to use that to my advantage. Secondly, the wonderful thing about dinners, when you go to dinner with a bunch of men, they want to sit next to the girl. <laughs> I always had the good seat. I mean, every time it was like, if you could be, you know, somewhat conversant, you know, conversational and well read, you'd get a good seat. So I was like, make sure I'm well read and make sure I can speak on a range of topics at all times. That's just 101. And over time, I noticed on my boards and things like that, I said, well, you get to sit next to Melody. Are you? And I don't say this with an ego. It was just like, OK, if you've got 10 guys in the room and you're the only woman, the woman is more interesting. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of it. And then the last part is, OK, my business partner who started Ariel is 11 years older than me. And for the first, I would say, 10 years of my career, I called myself his grasshopper. I went everywhere he went. I was like a chief of staff who became a chief operating officer who became president. But I mean, really, when I say I went everywhere he went, I went everywhere he went. And we would like, yes, take red eyes or, you know, land in the middle of the night and you know check in in hotel rooms and things. And we'd be at the front desk checking in, and they were like, are you two together? Because he's black. And he'd be like, no, we're not together. You know, he'd make this huge deal of it. And I was like, he wishes. You know, I was like, right. you know, he made it into this, like, you know, we can't have them think. And I was like, settle down. It's fine. You know, it's like I'm not overreacting or feeling like this is the worst thing that ever happened. Last but not least, in the same way, a CEO, major, major CEO, financial services company, who's quite a character once, said to me, John was there, he's like, gosh, you're like his work wife. I was like, yeah, without the perks. No perks. I said, I don't get anything. There's no like great, shiny gif that comes. There's nothing. I said, but yeah, you're right. And I said, the great thing about a really good wife they're kind of in charge. We all know that, right? <laughs> so I didn't get upset or offended or anything like that. I was like, yep. And you know what's really great? He would tell you he needs me desperately. Mm -hmm. He would tell you that. And it would be genuine. And I know what role I serve, but it's as a peer. It's not as, you know, someone's wife doesn't mean you're second class. Mm -hmm. You know, you're hopefully in a modern day, it's a peer. So it's a long way of saying, as all of these things came to me over time, there are two roads. You know, there's kind of the bitter, annoyed, and there is the mm, 300 people in the room, and I'm the only black woman. OK. But by the time they, I leave, they will all know who I am. Because I will be the mo most easy person to remember. You know she was the black woman who? Right. Totally good with that. But I'm going to be someone who they perceive to be knowledgeable and smart. And I don't see that being lacking in humility. I worked really hard to show up that way. Right. Well, I'm curious, Chris, have you been in a room of all women that been the one man and experienced that yourself? Because I'm always curious about what the male experience is of the same. And, and I'd just love to hear from you on this. Not that they remembered my name. <laughs> um, I am pleased to say it was uh, a senior staff meeting about a week ago. And uh, two of the senior men on my team were traveling, and so it was all women. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize it. I think it was the ladies on the staff. And I guess my biggest, um, Bill, on your story, it, two personal interactions that I've had. One, um, my daughter got blessed, got a great summer job, um, and was interning. And she texted me in the morning and said, wow, it's a really diverse workplace. I'm like, well, that's kind of surprised me, because it was a science place. And sure enough, all the ladies went off and were all the receptionists and secretaries, and all the men were the engineers. And then she texted me in the afternoon. She said, yeah, I don't think I really want to ever be an engineer. Um, and the other experience she had in her life was she has an absolute passion for math. And her friends, her girlfriends, 
were the ones pulling her out and saying, nah, you don't want to do that. That's boring. You don't want to do that. And, it, and she felt like she had to, and she was the only girl in the math, in the advanced math class, she had to buck the trend. So I guess it's a way of turning that around, like you're saying, play to everything at your advantage. Uh, we did a search a year ago. The panel, uh, the headhunter is a woman. Uh, it's myself and my deputy CIO, who's a woman. woman. The, my two deputies are women. And we came to the finalist, and all four finalists were men. And I was the one that said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you got to go back and do this. I want at least half of our finalists have to be women. Um, and I was surprised that I actually got some pushback. Well, no, we want the right people. Um, and so another story, I will tell you in the end, we did have a finalist of, of two women, two men. We hired a woman. Um, and, and the other example would be uh, in my infrastructure group, so not a very diverse field because it's very new. Uh, but I have an ethnic woman who runs that group. And her first four hires were all white male. Um, and she was very proud of her team. And I didn't want to crush her, but I just said, that's great. Your next hire cannot be another white male. Then you will have an entire team that is group think. And she said, but I'm not seeing any women in this field. And my answer was, go create one. Go to the universities in our area. There are women in the investment clubs. Get them interested. You know, There's very few people with infrastructure experience coming out the street. So I guess it's turning that around, which is women have to help women. There, there are a few men that will, but there aren't enough. And the women really have to go out of their way to help women um, and pull each other up. Um, it's back to that corporate boardroom. I mean, Melody, I'm sure you've been a, a, on a few corporate boards. And it's like, if you're the only woman, that's good. But you stick out. And you've got to break down that wall and say, you know, next time we interview, it's got to be more women on this list. You've got to work harder and get more women in. Our staff meetings, I guess I would, I'm pleased to say that gender in our staff meetings, our senior staff meetings, and our full staff meetings doesn't, isn't a factor because we really are nicely diverse. And it just is kind of, you know, it, we, we're creating a mentoring program in part just for what Sisma said is trying to help people and help women advance faster so that they're on a fast track, not on a slow track. Funny enough, I run an organization that is 5,000 strong, half men and half women, and that includes my board. And it is always uh, present. The gender issue is always present. It's very interesting. We'll be in a board meeting not discussing a gendered issue. It'll be discussing, I don't know, the budget or something else. And something will happen, and it'll break down on gender lines. And we'll have to do some work to get it back to topic. But, it, but I think it's an interesting uh, learning that we've had along the way that when you do reach that level of inclusivity, it's actually on a rare space. And you've had it long enough that you've figured it out. We're, we're still fairly new at it. The board has only been diverse since I've been CEO. And it's, um, it's a really interesting dynamic to watch men and women actually work together as peers versus as mentors. Shauna, earlier you had a really, you and I were talking, and I loved your call to action for women entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because you know we sit there in the valley where 20 years has passed, and we have not seen an increase in women GPs, nor an increase in funding going into women entrepreneurs, even though women are starting more and more businesses. 2% last year, exactly. <laughs> I'd love you to share that, because I thought it was really a powerful idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I thought a lot that, about this, actually, on the investment side and then leaving to start my next company. but. Um, I feel like the power is actually in Silicon Valley in an odd way is in the entrepreneurs and the founders' hands. At the end of the day, the ones that are sought after, all of the investment firms want to get into the same deals. right? So there's a long tail of lots of people who are out there looking for capital and trying to get capital. But then there's a very small number that are the hot deals that everybody wants to get into. And something I fantasize about is that that small number of CEOs put out a statement to everybody that was interested in investing them and said, you know, we're going to only take money from those teams that have made diversity a priority. And I feel like that would be a power shift because Silicon Valley lives and dies on deal flow. If you're sitting there and your full team is you know, an all-male set of GPs and you're going to lose out on a hot deal because you do not have a diverse team, then you're going to rethink your team. And that's like, at the end of the day, it's that business and those deals that make or break every decision that gets made. So it's a fantasy right now, but that would be something I'd love to see. I think you know, a starting point um, that is probably 
slightly more practical for every entrepreneur who ever goes in, you oftentimes, you know, you're grilled for a long period of time by the investors who ask you a million questions. And then they ask you quickly, do you have any questions for me? And, you know, you might ask one or two questions. What do you invest in? How do you make your investment decisions? I'd love to see in all of the entrepreneurs, even those that know that they have no shot of getting funded by whoever they're sitting across from, asking, you know, what, what are you doing on your team to increase the diversity? And I think just opening that conversation and everyone in the dialogues would also start to go a long way to a little bit of introspection from the investor sitting across the table from them. So I have one last question for the panel, and then I'm going to open up for questions. If people want to get prepared, we do have a microphone. So I'll ask that you get identified by one of the room monitors who is walking around at the back and has the microphone. But my last question for the panel really has to do with this, this fact that nothing has changed in 20 years. You know, we, we actually have all the great research. We have MIT publishing great research that shows that inclusive teams outperform again and again and again against uh, heterogeneous, excuse me, homogeneous teams. And that is even when the team that is diverse is less intelligent individually. So not hiring for the best candidate isn't necessarily the best strategy, but hiring for the best team is. So we have all this great research around the critical role of inclusive teams, gender inclusivity, racial inclusivity, economic background. And I'm struck that we as an industry who pride ourselves on taking data, running through the data, and then investing based upon that data, have for 20 years sat on this data and not moved. And I'd love your closing thoughts about how we, not closing, because we're going to open up to questions, but, but this is my last question to you. How do we get this to move? We've got the data. How do we get it to move? So I would say we individually have to hold these companies responsible and accountable. So at Ariel, for example, we invest in public companies, small and medium-sized companies. We tend to be one of the largest shareholders of our domestic equity holdings. And not so much true in our international and global, which is a lot of mega cap names. But in our domestic equity, we have a bias towards smaller companies and tend to own a lot of them. So as a part of our due diligence on the company, we talk to them about the diversity of their board and the diversity of their team. And they know they're going to have to answer this question from us on a quarterly basis because we tend to own our names more than five years. So after a while, we're not going to sell the stock because of it. But the amount of energy we're going to put around it is going to ratchet up because then we're going to wonder about their decision making on other things. So we've had many of those companies back come back to us and say, give us names. And we can point to lots and lots of companies where we've affected the outcome, not with an aerial board member, but with a person that changes the complexity or gender of that room because we say that it's important and we impress upon them. Chris has obviously been able to do that with um, Calsters in a very specific way. And I think that's led the way for New York and some of the work that they did there. And so you can see the ripple effect that comes. But I think we have to hold each other accountable, as opposed to, as we like to say at Ariel, we need to stop admiring the problem. It's fun to sit around and just kick it around of like how unjust it is and how nothing has moved in this, that, and the other. But we'd say to ourselves, what individually are we all going to do? Last point. I had a conversation with someone in Silicon Valley who was at a big firm, very, very successful, very famous, very wealthy. And I said, you know, I think you should make it a policy of your firm that no company will go public or change hands that you own without a diverse board. No company. He said, well, we can't do that. I said, well, why not? He says, well, first and foremost, um, our own diversity is not very good, so people in glass houses <laughs> cannot throw a stone. That was his first argument against it. The second argument was, um, listen, our job is to help entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneur, at the end of the day, gets to make a decision about how they run their company and this, that, and the other. And I said, until they screw up your money. <laughs> then you're in there and all over them like a cheap suit, right? Mm -hmm. So you set all sorts of policies and procedures, and you'll go and you'll fire people if they're not delivering. But the reason that you won't do this on this issue is because it's not important to you. So I actually do better if you just don't lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it's not important, and I will move on. Don't have four pages in your annual report on the importance of diversity and inclusion. Don't give me the politically correct answers that you think I want to hear, which are not true. 
Because last point, a friend of mine runs a hedge fund in New York. I was going to see someone he had worked for who was a very, very famous executive on Wall Street. And I called him before the meeting and I said, I've got to go to this lunch with this person. And I was like a pipsqueak. I was like 30 years old. <laughs> and I'm going into like, you know, where the heavy breathers are for lunch. So I say, what should I keep in mind? They want me to come and he wants to ask me some questions about diversity. He was like, he doesn't care about diversity. <laughs> I said, well, why does he have me coming to this lunch? He said, let me explain something to you about him. These are his words. This person is effing scary. If something doesn't happen that he says is important, you get fired. Mm -hmm. If diversity has been an ongoing issue and nothing has happened, it's not important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand that and not walk around with these rose-colored glasses believing what people tell you. Hence, back to the executive in Silicon Valley, don't pretend that this is important to you because it's not. Love those words. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? Thoughts? Mm. I'm going to open it up then. Do we have we have a question there? I can see a hand up somewhere. Uh, while the so I'm, can you hear me? Yes. While the institutional venture capital world has not been great about investing in women, there have been women who have realized the opportunity that exists to invest in women-owned companies. So you have Springboard, which has tremendous numbers in terms of the billions that they've invested, the exits that they've had. You have Golden Seeds, which is a very different type of platform. You have Sonia Perkins with Broadway Angels and, and other funds that exist. Can that, and Astia. And Astia, Thank you. yes. And, and sorry, yes. Can, that, can that, A, take the place and B, become the example that gets the institutional world to make change? Or is it just going to be a sideshow? You want to take that? I'll, I'll actually gladly take it. So you know, at Astia, we launched our angel group two years ago. And they're one of the most active angel groups in the country, having invested in 26 deals. Sean is one of our really uh, exceptional entrepreneurs we've invested in. We just launched in London. and they're doing diligence on two deals, and they just started that last week. So there is a great opportunity to invest in women-led deals. Having said that, where the game gets rigged is actually well above where we're all punching right now. Um, you heard the numbers in private equity. You hear where the capital comes from, and the, the way that it uh, comes from there is on the same networks that then are expected to change somehow at the venture level. Right, so it comes from uh, a male handshake, quite honestly, a Wharton, Harvard, or Stanford white male handshake to a Wharton, Stanford, or Harvard white male handshake. And then it's expected to disrupt and somehow find its way to a more diverse audience be below that. And it's my firm belief that, that until we see a change in the, um, the uh, color and gender and uh, a whole lot of other diversity issues at the very top echelons of this industry, we're not going to see a change below. There, it just doesn't work that way. This business is tightly run by relationships, and it's tightly run on trust. And it needs to. It needs to run that way. It's not that we're a sideshow. It's that the, the game is just rigged against us if we don't change something even above us. And I come out of micro, you know, having studied women's participation in mar markets at the microenterprise level, and actually left that because that they do so much better in micro lending and getting women into economies and markets at the micro lending level than we do in venture capital. And until we fix top of the pyramid, all of the bottom of the pyramid investing that we're doing will continue to be trampled down by the top of the pyramid that continues uh, along its old strategy and, and fails to be disrupted. So my own personal belief is that we do have to disrupt at the top, and that's in the boardrooms, in the executive suites, and at the LP level uh, of, the, of the funds. Two thoughts just yeah, to add to that. Um, so there's two, two problems. One is that it's primarily seed investing that females are getting into right now. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's one of the more accessible right now. So there's a lot of companies going out and raising their seed rounds more than ever. And then uh, there's a huge, what they're calling kind of the Series A crunch. But the companies then going to raise their Series A, there's many less firms that are positioned to lead a Series A 
Series A, and then even less as you go on beyond that. So I think until you start seeing some you know, female-led or predominantly female, there are a few, but, a few, but more than a few that can then do the follow-on rounds, those female-founded companies that get funded for a year or two who then can't find capital that, need, that allows them to continue to expand are gonna continue to die out at that stage. And it connects into the other side of the, the same problem, which is we don't really have a household name. There's no Mark Zuckerberg. You know, there's like no Larry and Sergey who had started a company and sold it and is a, seen as kind of a premier female leader. There's Sheryl Sandberg. Um, I wish she was an entrepreneur and had started a company. I want one, I, I want her, her equivalent of a startup founder um, who is a household name around the world. And similarly, investors, right? There, there are investors in Silicon Valley who are very much, they've, they've been there for years and decades, they've made their name, they are legends. There's not, there's not the same level of female equivalent. Again, there are a few sort of in those ranks, um, you know, a few that I respect greatly, but I don't know that that network expands much beyond a small closed network in Silicon Valley who know their names. Yeah, I, I would just, uh, I would add that I think you're absolutely right. I mean, at the LP level, there aren't enough women allocators of capital. There just aren't. I mean, in the top 25 public plans in the country, there were three women. I was one, then I left, now there's two. And there's really just one who runs one of the bigger plans. Um, and the other woman, she's great. She runs number you know, 23 or 24. Um, and then within these private equity funds, as I told you, I met no women at those levels, and now I've met two. Um, and so, if, yeah, I think that'll help. But there are women hedge fund managers that I know who started their businesses and started their funds, and their performance is great, but they have $50 million under management or $100 million under management, and they can't get to that next threshold where you start to get more institutional capital because there aren't enough allocators out there willing to honestly take them seriously or, or even look at them because of all these unconscious biases that exist. Um, you know, there's one story where there's a woman hedge fund manager sitting across the table from a bunch of men allocators, they work at a fund of funds, and they're having a conversation and a dialogue, and they're talking through the portfolio and the stocks and asking lots of questions, and she's really smart and talented and knew every answer to every question about the stocks. But then at one point, you know, said, oh, is that your idea, or is that, you know, your husband's idea? Or, you know. And this was like a true story, right? So there are these, there are these, these biases that we just have to try to break down. But until then, there just need to be, I think, more women allocators to help. And then that's that whole pipeline issue again. And more discussions about the biases. So last year, Harvard and, uh, and Wharton published a study that once again showed that the least likely to get funded in the venture world is an attractive white female. And uh, you're 60% more likely to get funded if you're a white male. And, and it was all other things being equal. So I think, but we have to talk about these things, right? Until we start talking about them, it's really hard to eliminate hidden bias. And because every VC will, or every investor will tell you they just want to invest in good deals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and <laughs> unfortunately, these things play out differently with pin bias. I think the mic is here. I think the mic is here. Wonderful. Hi. I'm Carol Kretschmann. And I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur. And uh, so I've been around this industry a long, long time, a decade in Silicon Valley as, a, as an investment banker, um, met with a, you know, for clients, uh, met with a lot of the folks that are still there. And uh, so I started a company about three years ago that's a hardware software company and we have a patented software that's disruptive and we're just moving into the world of finance. We've got our seed round is done and we're looking for Series A. And I have many, many friends. I mean, I go back to Gilbert Forbes conference and George Moore. And, you know, I'm just gonna move you to your question. So what I'm seeing here <laughs> today and have seen here for 10, 12 years that I've been coming here, is that this bias is institutional. It's inbreded in the financial world. Even today with Cheryl sitting on that, you know, this dais with three men who were treasury secretaries, she could have easily been there because she was in the treasury. It is part of this DNA that we have, whether it's of color or of gender. And what I see is the smaller venture funds or seed funds like Stringboard and everything, that's kind of a sideshow and it's pulling away from all of the real problems that we have, which is 2% last year of Silicon Valley money went to women-run companies. 
So you're all in the right track. But how do we get it faster? I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> I've been around the, the rodeo too long. How do we speed this up? Is it from the youth, the girls that are in school? Do we have an institutional kind of push for them to get into math and science? Is that important? What's the future? How do you break this logger jam? We all agree we're in the same place. How so do we make it So the question is, change? how do you speed it up? Anyone want to take it? Well, I think one way is that if you look at the demographics of uh, the transfer of wealth in our society, you're going to see a large number of women inherit money. And as a result of that, those women can actually be very vocal about how they want that money invested. Well, no, I'm asking, I'm suggesting that they, they control and they have in some situations, but the, the, the financial services industry recognizes that the financial consultants and their makeup is going to have to change very quickly because of this transfer of wealth, which is in real time because of baby boomers. So because of that, a woman is much more likely to inherit money than a man, even in the same family. Just because of our paternal, paternalistic way that America has come together, a father will leave more money to the daughter, and all the math shows that. So financial consultants and a lot of the wirehouses and big investment firms recognize they need more women to service these potential customers. But more importantly, let's just say they aren't there to service the customers. I'm saying that the women will actually have the funds to be able to say, this is what I would like to see. And the one thing about business, which is very, very practical to me, you ultimately bend to the will of the customer. Mm -hmm. Because the customer is who puts food on your table. So when Chris Ailman says, I want to see diversity, I know of some companies that have added women to their boards because of Cal Sturr saying, we're not going to vote the proxy. That's a heavy-handed way to do it, but it works. So women are going to actually also, if we you know, use our own power for good, we're going to be able to ask those same questions. I bet many of the women in this room have financial advisors, and they could say to them, I, I, I would argue, or they're putting money in their 401k plan at work. They could go to HR and say, do we have women-owned firms in this lineup that I could look up? Do we have minority-owned firms? And if more and more people start to do that, the, the world will react. And I'd reflect upon what Shauna said earlier, which is entrepreneurs are in a perfect customer relationship with VCs who are service providers to you. And that call to action is phenomenal, that entrepreneurs should be demanding this of their GPs. There was another question. Is there a mic over there? M Mike's here. OK, great. Thank you all for your inspiring uh, but also See. challenging words. Um, I am a woman <laughs> in venture capital. My, I have a question and I have a comment. My, my question is, how do you think equity crowdfunding can impact the ability for uh, women entrepreneurs to get funding now that checks are being written from half a million to 10 million in equity crowdfunding. And then in terms of being successful in finance as a woman, I'll tell you personally, if women can give up the dream of having happy marriages and raising kids, we can compete. Because I, I can tell you, my marriage didn't survive working 80 hours a week and traveling 50% of the time. And I have three kids that are amazing but it's really hard to balance it all. So I'll give you the yep. challenging comment, and then from a woman venture capitalist, and the question about can equity crowdfunding make a difference? Does someone like to talk about crowdfunding? Yeah. I mean, personally, I feel like um, most of the best deal flow I saw was still outside of the crowdfunding yeah. platforms. That's my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. Now you have a few big wins there. Just like anything else, it could start to change the game. But it so far hasn't happened. And I would also worry that it's still at the micro level, where it's going to get you that first million, two million, maybe even five million. But a growing company is going to need 10, 15, 20, you know, now $100 million rounds in order to get to that next level. And that's harder to see on a crowdfunding platform today. Um, that's my thought. I'll tell you what my big fear around it is, that currently women entrepreneurs are raising, in the high growth space, 1 15th the, 1 15th the capital of their male counterparts. And my fear around crowdfunding is that if women look to that to be their solution, they're going to be yeah. going to 1 25th the capital of their male counterparts. To raise a high growth business takes serious capital and a serious set of experts around you that crowdfunding does not necessarily bring. So, so I have more concerns about it than enthusiasm. Yeah, and actually, I'd say, I mean, being a venture, you'd probably know, but the venture investors add a whole other level when they put money into a company. So 
you know, very important to me in all my rounds was, was definitely the value add of the investors. And so it's harder to have that relationship. You could definitely do a piece in crowdfunding, but having somebody who's going to help you raise that next round and then really super important at the time that you're thinking about an exit, have those networks and those connections to think about an exit that you're not going to get if you're, you know, sort of crowdsourced amongst hundreds of people. The one last comment I'd make about your marriage and children point. I do think that, uh, you know, quoting Cheryl again and Lean In, she says the most important decision you have to make is the spouse you choose. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And you want to make sure that you have someone whose values as well as whose ambitions hopefully are in some way simpatico with what you're trying to accomplish over a lifetime. And I think one of the things that's harder is when we're younger, we don't necessarily have a fully formed picture of what that is. And so because of that, I actually think there are some benefits to the fact that marriages and babies are occurring at a much later stage. I was 44 years old when I got married and 45 year old when I had my baby and I'm 46 now. And I tell people, I would go back to my Princeton reunion and they'd say, you're not even divorced. There's something <laughs> wrong with you. You know, you really are broken. And I actually, you know, I remember uh, Sherry Lansing saying to me at a dinner at the Fortune Women's Conference, you're going to be a second wife. You are not first wife material. <laughs> and I think, you know, she was right. And there can be some truth to that. But there can be some benefit to not only being really, really choosy, but not being in a hurry. So our panel is, needs to conclude now. Let me thank the panelists, thank the Milken Institute, and also remind you of your call to actions that I heard from this panel. You all have a role to play. If you're an entrepreneur, you can set demands as a customer. If you're a large institutional investor, you can set demands as an LP. And if you are broadly in the ecosystem, there's clearly work to be done and opportunity to be had. So thank you all very much for your time today. Enjoy the rest of the Milken Summit.